Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the technician. 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 And they call him the technician. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Technician Podcast. Today, I've got my man Wa with me from Amend, and uh, bro, welcome. I'm really happy to have you here, and I'm assuming it feels really nice to start 2023 this way. Yeah, bro, it's really nice to start 2023 this way. And if I'm be completely honest, bro, I said yes to this podcast because I genuinely wanted to come meet you. <laughs> Appreciate that. That's we've, cool. We've got a mutual friend, Dane Muller, and I respect him um, for the for the man he is and the interactions and experiences we've had together. And he speaks so highly of you. At the same time, I've been watching what you do uh, in men's work. And I felt really drawn to come and just come and meet and connect with you. Mm, I appreciate that. And it's mm. it's cool the way that it's, it's worked out that way. Because I've been, geez, I've been following you for a long time, man. I sound like a stalker. But it's, <laughs> I, I, when I first met Jay, he obviously mentioned what he was doing. And this was like, when I first started doing this stuff in 20... I've been self-development space for about seven years, but really going into myself the last three years or so. Yep. And when we met in 2021, he mentioned the amend movement, mm. which initially, like, obviously there was like men's medicine, et cetera. Mm. And I was like, fuck, I, I looked at your page. and I was like, yeah, this is gun. So, and that was actually very inspiring for what I then moved on to do. Yeah. So it being, so it's cool how it's come around this way. And to think that that's happened in 12 months, mm. how was your 2022? Oh, how was my 2022? Um, there was a mix of everything. And if I had to sum it up, I would say 2022 was very fast and mm. beautiful. Yeah. And there's specific reasons to why it was so fast, and there's a very specific reason to why it was really beautiful. Gotcha. Do you want to touch on any of that? Yeah, fast in a way, um, I feel like <clears throat> for some moments there, Amend probably got bigger than... I had the capacity to hold. Mm. Um, so I was felt like I was kind of chasing my feet all the time. Yeah. And at the end of 22, I decided in November that I'll just take a, a complete break from all the work, which has helped me to come back home to myself and also to gain clarity of how I can continue to be me and show up in the work simultaneously without losing myself. Do you feel like that's pretty common for a lot of men or women that step into this sort of space? 100%. Bro. Yeah. And there's so many different reasons to why that will be. And the reason for me was, and, and, and even just as uh, you know, short as last year, you know, that little boy just wanted acknowledgement and love from his dad. Mm. And he was receiving love and acknowledgement from these people inside of the men community. So I was somewhat, and, and to the some way I've got to be really mindful of chasing that. Oh. Even you bringing that up makes me realize that potentially that's something that I haven't been aware of. Mm. It's almost like an unconscious thing that's been playing out, mm. which will get me into moments of strife where I'm like, I almost get a bit pissed off because something might not be happening because I'm, I'm not looking at the actual answer that is there. So knowing that you would have had so much come up last year, mm. what's one of the hardest things you had to deal with? Was there any shadows that were playing out or any little programs that were coming through? Yeah, well, I guess that's the second part of the answer that I initially answered. That was the most beautiful part. Yeah, gotcha. 2022, and what I mean by that is, yeah, in 20, uh, it was actually the end of uh, 21 that I met my beautiful partner, mm. and she was the big reason, and so the specific reason to why 22 was so beautiful, um, and also where all my deep shadows, you know, the second part of that question <laughs> that you asked, have been shown to me, and. It's in that in my relationship where I've had to really work, you know, the work that I've been doing on myself specifically for the last seven years was for the relationship. Mm. So I was a human who knew a lot. And I was I, I preached that I was a lot. And now I'm having to practice that as, you know, my beautiful partner shows these mirrors back to me. <laughs> and those were the deepest parts that I've, I've had to work on. And I'm still working on it right now in real time. Which I think, is almost necessary, right? Like we, we, we get to different levels and that same little devil will always be there. Mm. It's just, and Dane and I talk about this a lot where it's like the same thing will come up. It's just the way you're able to deal with it a lot quicker. Mm. It's almost like you see it, you feel it, you see it for what it is and you're like, 
I see you, motherfucker, and you're able to sort of, okay, let's talk this out. And that's where the, I'm assuming you're the same with, like, with my partner as well. I met her sort of beginning of 2022. She has been the most epic thing for my life. Beautiful woman, super supportive, gasses me up all the time. But also, same thing, the mirror aspect, where I'm actually not that used, I was saying this to Sammy, like, I'm not that used to having someone who's just backs me no matter what. And I actually even sit there some days and I question if it's even real. Mm. So what the hell is that playing out in me saying, do I even believe this is true? Mm. Do I deserve this? Congratulations almost. Yeah. Do you find yourself getting in that same space where you feel like you're not doing enough? Yeah, at times. And, yeah. I, and I definitely resonate with when you say, you know, someone backing me 100%. You know, even when I show up in the messy parts of myself, this person still backs me. Mm. It's like, hang on, I have past experiences and and more importantly i have deep programming that says people are not going to stick around <laughs> and in particular when i'm messy so for me to show up and be messy and to look to look in front of me and she's still standing there saying i love you still smiling like, and stuff wow, this is so unfamiliar therefore unsafe like and my coping mechanism with that is defense my coping mechanism is to reject that because mm. that's not safe for me wow so this this is like a beautiful segue into then how you got to this point. So did you grow up in NZ? Yeah, but I grew up in, in NZ. Um, very early years of my life, yeah, one to five years old, Auckland. And then we moved to Napier and grew up for, you know, all around Napier. There's a little area that's quite well known in, in Napier. It's called Marainui. And why I you know, preference that place is because that area, and anyone who knows it, is, is run by the Monk Mob, so a gang in New Zealand. Mm. Did you end up getting caught up in that during that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Yep. Yeah, my friends were a part of it. You know, my sister's partners were all patch members. Mm. All my dad's friends were patch members. So it's not unfamiliar for me to be in spaces, places, homes where people have got patches on their back. What was your experience though, like through that? Because I feel like there's a massive misconception about how that the gang life actually is, right? Because I mean, I've met some blokes that are you know classed as bikies, but they're actually being some of the most like kindest dudes I've ever met, really. Yeah. I say there's no different to the person with a suit on. It's yeah. no different to the person with a, a rugby jersey on. The, the, well, actually, the difference is societal's judgment of those people with patches on their back or you know, the opposite of a person with a professional rugby jersey on their back. Mm. It's the judgment of others. And it's knowing that the unconscious processes symbols so quickly, right? Mm. So we're told to, you know, we see a Nike symbol, we're like, oh, that's Nike, mm. Adidas, whatever it might be. We're told to believe that someone, as you said, with a vest and a patch on, that's a bad person. Mm. Worry about them. And it's like your the fear complex kicks in as soon as you see those colours or whatever and it's represented with the outcome that might be scary. So, yeah, man, that would have been an interesting come up because knowing that you were in that space because you didn't really have a choice, right, at the same time, but it sounds like it shaped you and moulded you to the man you are today. Yeah. So it was like a beautiful aspect of what you are well, yeah 100 percent, bro i remember from as early as i can remember all i wanted to be and i lived and breathed it was just as important as breathing was to be a rugby player a mm. professional rugby player that's all i wanted to do there was no other option union oh uh, yeah union yeah, yeah, yeah and in the back of my mind okay if i can't be a rugby player i'll just be a gang member yeah right and if i'm going to be a gang member i want to be big and scary like those dudes because they're cool like I, I grew up thinking those dudes with tattoos all over their faces those dudes with patches on the back they're so scary and I want to be that because people respect that. Mm. Do you think that's a pretty common thread for a lot of the boys that grew up there? 100%, bro. Or even anywhere where it's like gang affiliated or seeing that in their town. And like, was it a small country town or a little bit bigger? Or no, a little bit bigger. It's not country. Um, you know, it's probably you know, the size of, um, you know, Nobby Beach with a few streets in the background. So it's yeah, a gotcha. decent size. What's that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so. As you were coming up through that, when you started getting into rugby, was there something that you were like, nah, this isn't for me, or did you continue on playing? Uh, so no, I, we, you know, at the ages of three and four, which I can't remember, but, you know, stories from my parents, my dad wasn't able to play rugby unless he took my brother and I to rugby trainings and games. Mm. So rugby, like I said, was our lives. Um, I always wanted to play rugby, and there was always two sides of me. So my brother was um, yeah, quite a responsible person, where he would play footy, he'd go to school, he was a prefect. Um, and I, I, I guess I had two versions of me. I was a footy player, 
did all right at school, caused a little bit of trouble, but also had these mates where we'd go rob houses, rob cars, you know. Uh, unfortunately, and, and I'm not, uh, I don't regret this part of myself, I don't regret this experience, I'm not proud of it. You know, we'd end up assaulting people and having fights and all those sorts of things. So mm. there was two versions of me, bro. I like how you worded that because it was part of your life, right? Mm. And as soon as people try to run away from what they were, it's like that causes more issues, right? Mm. So did it take you, did you have a point in your life there where you look back and you're like, I um, I don't want to accept that part of me or have you always just accepted it? Uh, oh, bro, I was embarrassed of that part of me. Yeah, okay. 100%. For the most part of my life, I would try to hide that. Mm. I don't want people to know that I was angry. I don't want people to know that... Uh, you know, I wanted, I genuinely, the thoughts that I used to think is I wanted to hurt people. Mm. And why I wanted to hurt people and what I know now is because I was, I was hurt myself. Mm. The internal world being represented externally, hey? Yeah, so I would say that, bro, for the most part, hung around up until probably only five, six years ago. And if I'm being completely open and transparent, there's still parts of me that I'm like, oh, do I really want to show that part? Same. Mm. Oh, I think all of us do. And being in this space especially, you know, how's it going to be perceived? Mm. Like I know for a fact, and I was saying this to someone yesterday, where whenever I went on the football field, I was an absolute psycho. Mm. You know, was that a part of me that I didn't feel safe and comfortable to express off the field? So then I felt like as soon as I stepped onto that rectangle, I wasn't going to be judged for doing certain things, you know, like putting my hand in someone's face and being like, yeah, fuck you. Like, how do you like that? And letting... I think a lot of the stuff I suppressed out because I never actually spoke my mind off the field too. I was a super shy Mr. Nice Guy, right? Did you ever go through that phase as well where you, where you were like Mr. Nice Guy? Yeah, so you know when I, I spoke about you know, that, that part of myself that I wasn't, mm. I was trying to hide. So once I realised that, <clears throat> how I navigated that is I went from this dude who just went, was hurting everyone, this dude who was super angry, to the total other end of the, to the opposite end of the spectrum of Mr. Peaceful and Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> And what I was doing was just avoiding that dude. I didn't want to look into my own shadows. I didn't want to take ownership of that part of me. You know, I was shaming that part of me. Mm. And when I was in that space of my life and the years that went past, you know, I reflect back on like, fuck, I became a walking doormat, bro. Everyone was just walking all over me. And I thought I was this, you know, physically strong dude who stood up for himself. And that was uh, that was far from the truth. Have you always been this big? Uh, yeah, I've always been bigger for, yeah, yeah. My, for my age. Um, my dad's quite a big man. Yep. Uh, he's quite a solid man. And, you know, being the younger brother, I was like, food was scarce in our house, bro. Mm. And bro, we had to, for some, some parts of our lives, like fight for food. And, and like, get creative, bro, eh? Yeah, absolutely, bro. What, so was, what was the real creative meal you used to make up? Bro, wheat bix with hot water. Fucking oath. Yeah. It was gone. <laughs> so we had always, sugar. That was one thing we always had. Well, we didn't even have sugar, bro. Oh, we no. We didn't have the milk. We just had the wheat bix. Not even brown sugar? No. Nah. <laughs> and we just put hot water on it. That was yep. enough. And we were quite happy with our, our wheat bix. And it's it's actually something that I notice today when I'm going through something or, you know, I've just been through some emotional process. You know, I'll be in the kitchen and, and my automatic is to go to cereal. No way. Because that's comfort for me. Holy shit, you just brought up something for me. Mm. Wow, I'm like getting emotional straight away. Something. So, man, like, Sammy, there's a big box of cereal I just <laughs> bought around the corner. <laughs> Holy shit. It, it was almost like I went to the shops to get just like roast chook, you know, like bananas, a bit of fruit, some healthy stuff. And I went straight for cereal. I've been feeling a bit shit the last few days because I know I haven't been me this year. I've sort of had all this progression, all this like amazing things happening last year. And I feel like this year hasn't kicked off how I wanted it to. Mm. And I've noticed that I've started to, there's these little patterns playing out, these little comforts playing out. And that, I remember saying to my missus not long ago, I was like, I don't know why it is, but I love cereal. Mm. And it takes me back now to times when I was super depressed, like 18 years old living at home because I quit the Broncos at 17. And because of my identity crisis, not knowing what to do, my nights, bro, were gaming and cereal. Yeah, bro. Big fuck off bowls of cereal, like the Tupperware shit. Ah, oh, man. Okay, thank you for that. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> it comes as a coping mechanism, eh? Yeah, literally. So it's like, I guess it's that nostalgia, right? Mm. Do you feel like that's why a lot of people started loving all this vintage stuff that started coming up? They're like, oh, the the old gear reminds me of like, or say it's like a old cartoon or something. Mm. 
brings back those memories of those good times. Yeah, I think so, bro. Um, you know, anything that we, I guess, attach ourselves to for comfort, we, we, what we, what I would like, what I like to do myself, is to take a step back and go, oh, why is it that I'm attaching to that, mm. and notice when I'm reaching out for that, because is is that a coping mechanism? Is that a comfort mm. um, identity? Is that a comfort item? Yeah, you know, for another one for me, is, mm. you know, we talked about the shadows of my partner <coughs> when we we gone through you know, something big, bro. My body, the coping mechanism is let's go to sleep, mm-hmm. and I just want to sleep. And why that is because when I go to hiding when I was a kid, I'd get told to fuck off to my room or thrown in my room. And guess what? The first thing I would do, fall off to sleep. Mm. So my body has learned to keep me safe. And those emotions when they show up, it's like, let's go to sleep. Let's go to sleep. Sheesh! Anyone listening, if you feel that that's something that has happened in the past for you, and you find that you're dropping into those old patterns, maybe have a look into that. See what's attached to it. Yeah, 100%. And a really simple and powerful way to navigate, uh, to work through those coping mechanisms of old is to say, for me, it's like, okay, in those moments where coping mechanisms kept me safe, what was it that I actually needed? Mm. You know, In that moment, I needed my mum or my dad to come into the room and hold me and say, everything's going to be okay. Okay, so when I'm now reaching for those coping mechanisms when I'm an adult... I get to reparent myself and meet my own needs. Yeah. So you comfort yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's beautiful. It's something that recently happened with a client of mine where for so many years, bro, she was trying to figure out what this moment was that happened when she was three years old, where she was like, I won't say who it was, but someone had put her in a box or a cupboard because she was being naughty. And that played out so many times in her unconscious for the rest of her life up until now where she's like 29 years old or so and she's been seeing psychologists counselors all this sort of thing and they're like you need to forgive such and such you need to forgive such and such and we went through this process process called ect Mm. and we took it back to that time and i had this intuitive thought i was like oh it's not them you need to you need to you need to grab yourself and it was like she grabbed her three-year-old self and said i'm my own hero and like pulled herself out of that darkness, which she kept putting herself in in these moments that came up. Fuck the goosebumps I got and the release she had, bro. Wow, we and this is the thing, right? Like we we get told touching on it, what even I just said then is like um, you know being in this space of coaching, which is just a label. Like we, I feel like I'm a human helper at the core of everything, but I still get um, you know psychologists and stuff like, oh, these people, what are they doing? They think they can do this, this, and this, and it's like, well fuck man we're helping people (laughs) we're on the same journey like i don't sit here and bag everyone else that's trying to do this stuff right Mm. i focus on what i'm doing and do these things and i think it's so beautiful to know that what you've been through you've experienced it firsthand Mm. so now when you are helping a man like a one-on-one group whatever it might be you're feeling the feelings of it all and i think that's actually where the most healing happens as well um knowing that you said you've come from a lot of hurt what was it that was causing a lot of that hurt when you were younger as well? Ultimately, bro, just the want for my dad to love me. Yeah. Ultimately, that was it. Let that sink in for a sec because I feel like that's super common. Mm. You know, and knowing how that can affect you in that sort of age as well, what was it that you started to act out when you started to get a bit older, a bit bigger, a bit stronger? You could get independence, drive places, do these things, right? How did things start to transition then? Well, I moved out of home when I was 15. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> I, I, I created and I truly believed that I'm going to have to do this myself. Mm. I can't trust anyone. So I, I moved out of home. And I created this world where it was all about me. And whilst I was in this world that was all about me, I was so fucking hurt, bro. And because I was so fucking hurt, anyone that stepped into or had resistance to my world copped that hurt. You know, sometimes it came in physical cops. I mean, a lot of the time it came in verbal, mm. you know, emotional abuse. You know, there, there, were, there were some people that I truly did love 
you know, old version of me used to say, oh, I thought I loved, I said I loved them, but I didn't. No, no, I fucking loved them. And I, my version of love was abuse. Mm. And that was because that's all I knew. Literally. Mm. You're doing what you could with what you knew. 100%. Bro. And that's not to say, and I actually said this on a podcast last week, often when I'm speaking at workshops and when I'm having conversations with people, you know, they might look at my dad and go, fuck, he sounds like he was a monster. There was parts of him that was that, yes, just like all of us. Mm. My, my old man was such a fucking beautiful dude too. I love so many, I love all of me, and there's so many beautiful parts of me that I got from him too. I love that. It's, I don't know if you listen to Jay Shetty at all. Mm, yeah, bro. Did you hear his podcast with Kevin Hart? No. Kevin Hart's, bro, he's deep. Oh, I did not know this right, so... Bro. And one thing he said was, you know, we're told so many things like to, a lot of people get told to hate their parents for the way they brought them up or the shit they did. And right. Kevin Hart was like, nah, fuck that. My dad did the things he did. He became a gangster. He did all these things, but he taught me I didn't want to be that. Mm. So I love him for that, for him going through all that to teach me not to be like that. Mm. But he also was just doing the best he could at all times. Yeah. It's all he knew. Yeah. You know, he probably grew up with a dad that was in the war. You know, he had to fend for himself. It was in, like, Ghettoville. Like, just the environment, man. And I tell people all this time, like, the environment will trump Will all the time, right? Because did your dad grow up in the same place you grew up? Uh, no, nah, so he grew up in a quite a country area. Mm. You know, moved house to house. You know, I always had, as a kid, I had a belief that those were his parents. They brought him up. Mm. It's far from the truth when I got older and started to ask questions. You know, oh, no, your father got brought up by them. Your uncle and auntie, they got brought up by them. So I was like, oh, it wasn't this one big household of brother and sister, mum and dad. No, there was so much, in, in my language, disconnect. There was so much trauma. You know, and <clears throat> some of the experiences that my, one of my aunties shared with me regarding my dad, I just went, fuck, no wonder my dad parented us the way he parented us. Oof. See, it's that simple, right? Mm. Sometimes it can be, and it... Do you believe that it could be just one moment that defines the way that you will then show up? Mm. I believe it can be both or either. Mm. It can be one moment or it could be multiple moments. That culminations of those moments, yeah. It, I guess it all just depends on what I made that mean for me. Yeah, yeah. Is there any moment from that transition of leaving, doing your own thing where you where it was like, fuck, I need to change? Uh, fuck there. You know... I used to think, oh, it was that moment, it was that moment. Then I, look, I, I would take a deeper look and go, no, because you continued your patterns for years and years <laughs> after that. So stop bullshitting yourself and <laughs> trying to make the story sound cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was this one pivotal moment. Oh, I remember this time. I was sitting on the edge. <laughs> and like, yeah. Uh, so there were some moments, bro. And if, if I were to say there's a moment that landed for me that over time helped me to change, was having my son, mm. 15 years old. Yep. My mother and him, were, his mother and me were 15 years old when she got pregnant, 16 uh, when he was born. And I remember holding him for the first time, looked down, and I was like, holy fuck, I'm going to start caring about another human. Because <sighs> previous to that, bro, I didn't give a fuck about humans. Yeah, and did you also not give a fuck about yourself, obviously? 100%. Yeah. I, didn't, I actually genuinely didn't give a fuck. We were doing dumb shit, driving cars at 200 kilometers an hour, jumping off shit that we shouldn't be jumping off, you know, robbing houses, and then... Standing in the house that we're robbing, waiting for the dude to come out and see you can get the closest to him before we leave because we thought it was a big game and a joke. <sighs> we didn't care if one of us got grabbed or held onto or whatever happened to us because we didn't care about ourselves. See, this is a great reflection for people thinking that, you know, like they're calling like these Eshe kids, right? That are, there's a lot of it in North Brizzy is going on. They come up sunny coast and, you know, they ruckus, they cause some shit. And it's like people still have no compassion for how these kids were like built. Like, why are they the way they are? Yeah, fucking oath, bro. Those, those what people call eshes, and, and let's go back to our earlier conversation, the gang members. Mm. It's like, rather than judge them, can we drop into compassion, empathy, and say, oh, shit, how did you get to that place in your life? Literally. Mm. Because there's always a story for you. But, and, and it's usually the people that are judging, and I put my hand up and say, I've been one of them, and I'm still one of them every now and then. Yeah, I of course. Myself on that. It's like, ah, oh, fuck. It's like, oh, no, no, no. There's, that there's a reason for that, just like there's a reason why I show up shitty sometimes. Right. So what is it you think people are avoiding in themselves for them to be judging so hard? I, I say judgment's one of two things, bro. You know, when I'm sitting here judging someone, I'm judging a part of myself that I don't like. Yeah. Or I'm judging 
something in there that I want for myself. Mm, I I think that comes into what we were saying before with like before this even started was on the come up you're going to have people want to pull you down like the bucket of crabs start to kick in and a lot of the time I believe it's like when people see them actually actualizing their dreams and goals and doing these things it's such a big mirror for like fuck I'm not doing the things I said I would do mm. I'm not doing the things I said I wanted to do so clearly for you when your son was born at that age something shifted in you how was that journey then from there, like having a boy and stuff like that? Did you have another kid after that pretty soon or was it a little while be- between? Yeah, I had. So I had th- three kids by the time I was 19. Yep. Uh, so my kids today are 19, 17 and 15 years old. Mm. So they're two of them and you know, pretty much adults. Um, and for most part of their lives, bro, since they were very young, uh, their mum left you know, 10 or 11 years ago. Mm. So it was me and the three kids, which you know, there's pros and cons to everything. And one of the cons for me that I've only just realised, and I talked about my beautiful partner and the mirrors and the awareness she brings for me now is way back then when their mum left, you know, on top of me believing that people had left me in my childhood, I promised myself unconsciously that it's me and my children versus the world. Mm. And in that, anyone who tried to come into our space, bro, there were brick walls. No one was ever going to be able to let, be let in and which reaffirmed back to me like, oh, fucking no one's here for us. Yeah. It's like people are trying to knock on the door and walk in, but you, you've got fortresses up. Mm. I feel like that's pretty common with a lot of the men's work stuff. Like they don't want to believe other men are there to actually help. Mm. Like it's surrendering to the fact that there's people that genuinely just want to see you do well, mm. which is tough, man. Like and I can understand where you would have been. I was the same. I felt. I also felt in another way that I was a burden to everyone when I was going through my shit because a lot of people would be like, oh, why are you so sad all the time? What's going on? I was like, man, well, for 15 years of my life, I thought it was, I was a football player. Mm. It was literally from five years old up until 18 or something. It was my identity was the rugby league player, Trav. Mm. I was like six foot five by the time I was 10, right? So mm. it was almost like my destiny to be a football player. Yep. by that time and as I realise now I reflect back and I'm like no nah, I was given this vessel to be able to hold energy to be able to lead to be able to support and not to be broken on the football field but that was part of my journey clearly so as I reflect back as well with all those you know transitions what was happening identity did your identity shift to dad mode when you started having the kids and you had the kids as you and them against the world yeah it went into deep protection um, probably even for the most part unhealthy dad mode gotcha yeah, like literally bro anyone looked at my children the wrong way they copped that old hurt version damn man did did I see in your story as well that one of your kids had some health um, issues as well yeah so my oldest boy who's 19 years old he was born with retinoblastoma which oh. is cancer in your eyes and brain yeah, right. So at three weeks old, he, his right eye was removed, and then he the, the following day he had um, laser treatment because he had tumours in his other eye. And then for the next fo- the following two years, we embarked on a journey of chemotherapy. Fire out. Mm. I'm assuming he's a tough little dude now. Bro, he's the man. He's the man. You're obviously <coughs> you know, doing men's work. He's been to workshops. He's yep. been to walks. And he hears these stories of these big, strong men who were either suicidal at all at the workshop or the, or the walk and men who have shared experiences of their suicidal thoughts and attempts and he's just like why and he really f- he can't fathom why someone would want to leave this world and I look at him like fuck you're the man yeah well, you're the man. you've got every reason to feel sorry for yourself literally and you don't that'd have to say something about you then the way you've raised him yeah and you know, people have said that to me in the past, like, oh, it's a reflection of you, but I'm like, oh, you know, it's a ref- I deflect. Yeah. Cause I wasn't whoa, whoa, don't give me praise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, fucking know for my son's a reflection of me. Yeah. And then there's parts of them also that are hurt. And there's also parts that we're navigating right now you know, in regards to the expression, the unhealthy expression of anger mm. that I'm doing my best to not make him wrong in, but have the conversation so that he's able to explore that as opposed to me telling him what I think you should do. Yeah, no, I saw it's like a rediscovery of himself. Yeah, because I look at it, I'm like, holy fuck, that's me. Is he big too? Yeah, he's six six. Oh shit! Yeah, so he's he's not he hasn't filled out yet, but he's six six. I got a 40, my fourteen year old. Oh, he's fifteen next week. 
He's six five. Yeah, right. So they got a bit of a tall. Their, their mum's quite tall. Well, you're about what six two or something. Yeah, six two. Yeah, right. Man, so are they playing footy? Uh no, nah, they've always they did taekwondo. All my kids did taekwondo as soon as they turned five until mm. they were ten, and then they've all been boxing or doing muay thai since then. So always pretty big on um, self discipline, and I'm also really big on being able to defend yourself. I think it empowers you. I I feel it's like a couple of things there, especially with like there's a reason like Jets has gotten so big, right? With like self discipline and knowing how to control that anger. You know, I f- I feel something in the past for me was like that that reactive state mm. coming from insecurity. If anyone ever tried to call me on shit that I knew knew was true, mm. but I would just react and lash out and say something stupid or do something stupid. So I feel on that. So I know your journey is you started to kick into this stuff and started to have some realizations and some journeys. When was it you started to getting into the actual work of things? Uh, <clears throat> about 12 years ago, I was in, well, I'd actually just finished playing footy. I uh, come off my last contract that I've, uh, I was ever a part of, a rugby contract. And I was in between, I didn't have to work. And a friend of mine was working at a school. And she's like, oh, can you come in and help? We're down on workers. She knew that's what I did for work. I said, yeah, sweet. And I went in for a couple of days to help. And 10 years later, I was still at that school. It was a school for boys who'd been, Exempted from mainstream schooling. Mm. And I would say that's where a really big part of my journey started. And why I say that is because this school is based on not education but human values. Interesting. So human values is their number one go-to. And they start every single day with meditation. And when I walked in, bro, I was like, what the fuck's this shit? <laughs> and I resisted. I'm like, I'm not fucking sitting down to meditate. Yeah, I'll be respectful because I was always respectful. Yeah, yeah. People are people's practices and religion or whatever it might be. So I just sit there, but in my head I'm like, I'm not fucking doing this shit. How old were you? Uh, fuck, I would have been, oh, it was f- 12 years ago now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, I was, yeah, I was, a, I was a man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just resistant to anything that was, you know, a tool to turn inward. Mm. Did you feel it in you that something was like? Well, there was so much resistance, bro. So I was like, initially I was like, fuck this. And then after, you know, I'd say three months, definitely at six months, I was like, fuck. Why do, I, why, why do I want to meditate? Why do I want to actually feel like <laughs> meditating with these kids? And there's these two beautiful psychologists who, <clears throat> you know, set the practices for the school and they are so peaceful. Like probably the most peaceful people I've ever met. That's cool. And to have conversations with them, they'd hug you and I was like, fuck, this is wild, man. These people are out of this world. Yeah. You know, if I could say, for me personally, the most valuable thing in this world is inner peace. Agreed. So not knowing it back then, when I was looking at these people, I'm like, they're the most valuable, valuable humans in the world. You still remember them like clear as day, hey? Like an oath, bro. You never forget people like that. You know, I only recently left that school uh, like two and a half years ago. What was the school called? Do you, like, are you allowed to say like? Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. little school, beautiful school, um, and it's for, again, it's for boys that have been exempted from mainstream. These boys, bro, they smash the school up every day. Mm. They're smashing windows. They're trying to stab teachers. Um, Did you ever like someone try to stab you ever? Bricks thrown at me, kids spitting in my face, mm. branches at camps being smashed over my head. Far out. Um, you know what, bro? I defended those kids like they were my own. <coughs> mm. And everyone was like, oh, you care about these kids so much? And I did. And about three or four years into the, the into doing that job, I had a realisation. is like, I'm not defending these kids. I'm defending a little while. <laughs> and that's why when people talk shit about them or want to kick them out of the school... I'll say, if you're going to kick that kid out, I'll fucking leave with them. Because I was defending little me. Damn. Did you ever see any kids that sort of reminded you of you? Most of them, bro. <laughs> like, like looked like you and stuff? Uh, not that looked like me. There was definitely some kids that had very strong traits that I ended up building some really fucking strong um, relationships with. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and in that respect, definitely some kids that reminded me of me. <laughs> Damn. See, that's that's so important too, though, for you to... Like when we're going on this journey of helping others, we start to see parts of us that we never would have seen before, right? So it's like having that reflection back at us and knowing what you've done and what you've achieved with the men, especially and yourself. Like when was the turning point for you to really like go all in on this and like turn it into what you have done essentially? Do you mean in my own journey or in a... In a well, actually, yeah, let's start with your journey because clearly it was something one day we were like, okay... I need to actually make this a thing and like I become like a whatever, like a coach, mentor, men's work, et cetera. Yeah. For my own journey, bro, it was a relationship breakdown. And, and ultimately what it was, was like fed up with myself. Yeah. Okay, why is it that I keep ending up in the 
the same place in the same space. It can't be all these people. <laughs> it fucking has to be. <laughs> There's a common people. denominator here somewhere. Yeah. And I remember I vowed to myself, I was like, I'm going to fucking really find out who I am. And I'd been, I'd listened to a few podcasts and I heard this person say, he's like, you need to start noticing the way you think, the way you feel and the way you behave. And there's a reason to all of that. I was like, okay, cool, I'm going to fucking work that out. <laughs> and I thought I was going to work it out in like one hour. <laughs> that was far from the truth. So that's where my own journey started. Um, and then you know, working with, bro, working with men was pretty much like just happened. It wasn't an intention mm. because actually working, before working with men, I couldn't stand adults. I still couldn't stand adults. And why I couldn't stand adults is because adults hurt people mm. children don't so mm. if you ask people that i've worked with in the department of child safety and at school they're like fuck this dude cares about kids man like he'll actual go cares yeah way beyond for these kids because kids are so uh, innocent and they're not going to hurt me i felt safe around them mm. so i would help these kids help these kids and, and man we fucking done some great work over the 10 12 years working with kids and there was a conversation i had with a co-worker and he's like, fuck, man. These kids go home to their fathers. These kids go home to their, their mums. And it doesn't matter how powerful our program is. It doesn't help matter how much influence we have over them. Those two adults in their lives are always going to have more power or influence over them than we are. And it was in that moment, I was like, fuck, one day I'm going to start working with adults. Still had resistance because I still hated adults. So it's like working from that top down, hey? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that. Like my... My partner's been a teacher for ten years now. Mm. And she loves kids, bro. Like, but yeah. she's getting she's gotten to a point now where she understands that she can do what she wants. Same what you just said mm. to try help these kids, help them think a certain way. She loves psychology. She loves understanding people, and she does like sound healing and stuff. She's a musician, yeah, sick. and she was like, "Fuck this! I want to get into what you do because I feel like that's the only way to make real change." Mm. It's like working with the adults. Yep working with the mums, working with the dads, teaching them about holistic living, the breath work, the mindfulness, all these things to then hopefully filter it down into the kids. But then like you said, it's even getting them on board for it and helping them like see why they do it. But it's still keeping it. So it's like, it's not for the kids. It's still for them. Yeah. So my, again, my driving force is still for the kids. Yeah. I work with the dads now because I know dad has got more influence over their child than I ever will. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So, Knowing what happened for you, did you finally get your dad to say what you wanted him to say? Fucking oath, bro. Yeah? Uh, me and my dad have a beautiful relationship today. We talk to each other every single day. When I'm driving to the gym, I just call my dad. Morning, how are you? Yeah. And, you know, he shares with me some stuff that's going on in his relationship, some stuff that's going on in his life, his ups, his downs, and vice versa. Where it's like open books. And that's why I can speak so freely on podcasts or so freely at uh, workshops now. Mm. Because my dad <coughs> and I have a great relationship. I've asked for permission to share. And he's also healed parts of himself that he used to want to hide from people. And he, he definitely understands and he shared this with me. Like, if you speaking about our journey together helps a father and a son, I'm fucking happy. <sighs> That's cool. Mm. That's really cool. Has he been to your workshops? Yeah, bro. He comes, he holds space and everything now. Yeah, and, epic. And it's, it's a different energy when my old man's in that room. He's And I believe I, I, I embodied this from my old man. My old man can walk into a room and change the energy like that. Mm. And, and that's just something he, he embodies. And when he's in that room, bro, and he's open and authentic, the amount of people, and he's so raw. Like I, I look, I know, and it's because we have these cops conversations. We can be quite articulate. We can say all the wordy words, you know, the the workshoppy words. <laughs> My old man got no workshoppy words. <laughs> what the fuck's up, brothers? Uh. Fucking this and fucking that, <laughs> and it's so raw and authentic that people are like, oh fuck, I really want to listen to this dude. Yeah, and then you see the men in the room who have father wounds. Boom, boom, boom. All the tears start flowing, and then it's even more powerful when their dad's in the room too, because then we get to go through practices to process what is holding them back from being being connected. Fuck, I can't wait to experience that. Like, you know, we've got a, a father and son duo coming to the Heartlead Warriors retreat. 
I do, and I know who it is too. He's oh, like, true. Yeah, and he spoke to me the other day. He looked at me and goes, are you going? And I said, fucking no, if I'm looking forward to it. And he goes, we're going to, my son's coming. I was like, fucking hell, pal. Mm, that's cool. And that's that's when that's when we know what the stuff we do is like really making an impact. Because if you can get a father and a son with that generation, this generation coming together, fuck, imagine then generations afterwards. 100%. You know, that healing of the generational wounds. Because I even know f- to this point that I've taken on stuff from past lives. You know, I've, I've, I'm sure, have you done any like real deep breath work? You've had some sort of like visualizations of things that have happened that aren't of this world? Yeah, bro, 100%. Yeah. Are you open to speaking about any of that? Yeah, I'll share one. Um, well, my first experience of breath work, <coughs> I went to this workshop and these guys dropped us in. Fuck, you might see this, you might see that. Cool. And I breathed, bro, and I came out and I thought, fuck, have they done nothing to me? Mm. And then all these people started standing up and they were crying and I seen my grandfather. And I was like, in my head, I was like, fucking bullshit. <laughs> you know, You're just trying to be cool. In that moment, I had so, still had resistance to the work. And I was like, I don't trust you. I don't trust you. You're all shit. This is yeah. why people don't come to shit like this, because you just all talk shit. Mm. And then I went to another workshop post that one. And same thing, breath work. And I was like, oh, whatever, bro. I'll give it a go. I've come here. I've spent money. My time is the most important to me. And bro, in that breathwork session, <laughs> holy fuck, <laughs> I was that dude who stood up and couldn't speak because he couldn't stop crying. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, welcome, son. Yes, bro. So that was really powerful for me. It's in that moment that I <clears throat> was like, wow, this breathwork thing is fucking for real. Mm. And now I take back all my judgments of all those people that went before me who I judged. And then, you know, a year after that, I did a breathwork with a man here on the Gold Coast who taught me a lot about breathwork and my great-grandfather come through. And all I knew, my great I knew nothing about my great-grandfather. All I knew was he has the same name as me. Mm. And all these messages came through. Like I'm talking, like had a conversation, like you and I having a conversation right now. And then I share with my oldest uncle, my dad's brother. <coughs> and he started, I didn't share anything specific. I just said I, he came through. And he started to share story. You know those old Maori people? Mm-hmm. And they start sharing story. Fuck, bro, you just want to listen. Oh, and dude, bro, Billy Bannister reminds yeah. me of someone. <laughs> Everything he was sharing, bro, was what happened in that breathwork session. And I was like, you're bullshit. Talking about you know, how he used to walk through bushes with men as a healer. Oh, wow. You know, this is not my dad, not my grandfather, my great-grandfather who has the same name as me. I knew nothing about my great-grandfather. And he used to do the same thing that I'm doing today. Shit, that's cool. Mm. That brings so much tradition to it. Mm. And that did that make your purpose and the reason for you doing this thing go like even stronger since learning that? Empowered me more than a lot of things have. Um, you know, a few years ago I got sick doing the work and I was down and out and I'm not too open to um fuck what are those people you you go to? What are the names of them and they um, like re- get connect with spirit and Reiki, sh- not Reiki, clairvoyance. Um, yeah, clairvoyance. That yeah, thing. and Jay Godfrey paid for a session for me. It was like three hundred bucks. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, I'll go to this thing. And I'm, you know, sit there going, oh, okay, I'll still skeptic. Yeah. Skeptic. And she kept saying, "There's this big man sitting next to you." And I've actually felt this person since I was a little boy. Mm. And um, bro, long story short, at the end of the session, she goes, "Oh, the the person's back again." And they've asked me to tell you that they've got the same name as you. <laughs> Bro, I don't, none of my friends knew it. I've never posted it on social media. Like I said, I knew my great grandfather's name and that was it. I didn't talk about him either. And when she said, because all the things she was saying about him up until that point where she confirmed it was him, I was like, oh, mm, mm, skeptic, skeptic. When you said that, I burst into tears. I was like, fuck. Mm, it just yeah. confirmed everything. Confirmed to me. So when I drop into breath meditation now, you know, guides who are not of this human world, mm. Bro, I embody that so deeply and I trust when a message comes through for me. And I've created my own language between me and my great-grandfather to, to what is a yes and to what is a no. So when I ask questions, the yes will come through and I'm clear of what it is and he always shows me. Do you have a Native American guide? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Because when you were just talking about it, I just got like real emotional. Mm. And I've got one. And someone, I remember someone said that there was almost a purpose behind the genocide of all the Native Americans because mm. they were meant to be spirit guides for most of the world. Mm. And I've got Native American, Aztec, ancient Aztec, and a Spartan 
Mm. And this is where Dane comes in, right? So I don't know if you know how we actually like started to connect. I don't know the story. (laughs) Dane has touched on it. Essentially, like, yeah, I had our breathwork session during NLP, like September last year. Um, That was Dane's first, but mine, I think like sixth or seventh. And I'd had some pretty hectic things happen, like cool shit, seeing things, whatever. This one, man, I like... (laughs) I'm glad you're open to this and you've had your experiences. Otherwise, you'd be looking at me like, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm um, not that skeptic, dude. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I've told it a few times on the potty and I know there's people that are like, what? I've got video of it. Like, I can show you after. But um, essentially, I went back to a time when I was an Aztec warrior and it was the first part was me sending our tribe out to kill this tribe for what they did. Um, and I was like this big, like, I was, I was speaking another language. Mm. Whatever they spoke back then, I was speaking that out loud. I didn't realize that in my head. I'm like, go now brothers, go kill them. And then what's coming out of my mouth was completely different. Mm. And then I, another part was me coming home and seeing my wife and kids dead because that's what the other tribe had done. And then it was the chiefs around the fire um, being like, how could you let this happen? You're our protector. You're our guardian. And then I kept saying, I'm sorry. I didn't see them. Forgive me out loud. So they got one of the facilitators to just whisper in my ear and say, we love you. We forgive you. It's Okay. So it's almost like that night it healed a massive piece of shame mm. in my body and guilt. And I don't know what happened, bro, but just fucking like opened my whole body up to whatever it is that's been trying to connect with me. Mm. Next day we have a clairvoyant in the room and he's now like one of our spiritual guides uh, for myself and Dane. And he comes up, he's like, mate, I need to talk to you right now. Mm. Takes me outside and he's like, you've got this guardian, you've got this, he's the one telling me about this. And... Then Dane was sort of st- standing off the side and he's like, I sort of looked at him and was like, it's weird that he's there. Dane, come over here for a second. As soon as he stepped in our little circle, um, Roy's like, whoa, what the fuck? He instantly felt that what he'd just been telling me about the Spartan mm-hmm. past life. He goes, Dane, do you have any connection to it? And Dane got like all teary and I did too. Goosebumps and shit. He pulls his sleeves up and he's got like Spartans and everything all over his forearms. And Roy just goes, yeah, you two were Spartans in a past life together. Mm. And as soon as we both heard that, we were just like, fuck, this is legit. And yeah, bro, then Heart Led Warriors was built or born that day. The retreat was started like fucking eight weeks later. Now we've got, you know, what we've got now. That's building so quickly, right? Yes, so you know when you know. Yeah. When you meet people. <clears throat> it was the same with Jay, man. When I met him, I felt like I've led battles before with him in a past mm. life or something. So... It's when you start to step into this, what have, may have been as the woo-woo before we got into it, do you find that the men are pretty open to it when you take them on the um, workshops? Yep. Yeah. And why I say that is because, and something that I'm really big on practicing is remaining human. Yeah, always, hey. And I'm not judging my friends because that's their journey they go on. I've got some friends that are very connected to mm-hmm. the spiritual world and like fucking kudos to you, my brother something that I will remain in is connected to the human experience. Real grounded. So, yeah, I feel like, does it land at workshops and walks? Yes, because for me (laughs) and what I've been told and what I truly believe is like, I trust you because it feels real. Mm. As opposed to some other people that might share it because they're so far off in the spiritual (laughs) world, which is fucking cool and powerful. Yeah. Because I go and play in that space also. Same. Um, So, yeah, People trust it because we we play in the balance of or simultaneously connect to there and be in the human experience as well. I think it's really important, especially doing men's work, because like playing in the in the human world is so important because essentially a lot of them haven't had a chance to get real esoteric and you know spiritual, which is f- cool, right? It's how you give them the ability to see that. And like for me, I've seen that in this space, it's starting to change. Lately, there's some sort of... Have you felt that shift? Yep. yep. What do you think that is? Uh, well, first of the reason is because if we go and play in the spiritual world and it become disconnected to the human, we lose touch with the masses. Because for the most part, you know, we, we know this from experience. We weren't connected to spirit at all. Mm. So I wasn't going to connect to spirit through a person who's only in the spirit world. Give me a brother who looks like and sounds like me, and then I might trust you. hundred so that I think that's a really big thing for men like us, and there's definitely a place for other men who are just only in the spiritual world. 
Because, man, when I go connect with my brothers that are, that are way up there, I'm like, fuck it. Yeah, I have fun. <laughs> I have so much fun in there, bro. Because you know it's real. You yeah. know what's going on. Well, it's like that experience that you and Dane had, you know, how Heart Led Warriors was, was birthed. People may believe it. People may not. Yeah. In the end, it's irrelevant because it's fucking true for you and an experience that no one can ever take away from you. Yeah. And I think you've nailed it where we sort of give off that persona, which is just us, you know. We take the piss out of each other. We we have fun most of the time. And it's that common misconception that, oh, you know, this this coaching world's all real serious and stuff. And it's like, nah, man, like I'm still like the dude that if I catch up with my old mates, I'll go to the pub and like play the pokies and stuff if I want to. I don't get caught up in that. And I believe it's something that's really holding us down um, in a lot of spaces because it's like addictions for a lot of the boys I know, which is cool. But when they're ready for the help, they'll be ready. But it's knowing that I have that ability, like you said, to to flow between the two. And mm. I think that's so important. And I feel, or I know, that's why you've done so well. Mm. Is because you've not only experienced a life, as people would have just heard in your story, that's tested you and broken you in parts, but you've been able to come to this point now where you're still healing. We're always, well, not healing, but we're always working on ourselves, right? So where do you think it's next for you? Like, what do you, what are you wanting to do this year? Because... Last year was that mix of the two. It was like fast and beautiful and yeah. all the things. What's next for you in 2023? Uh, yeah, I'll try some of a few sentences. <laughs> Stay grounded yeah. and, and, and ensure that I'm home with myself first before I, I preach anything. And that's something that I'm having to practice right now in my relationship. Mm. And I had the conversation just this morning with my partner about this, like, we're out here preaching a word are we first practicing it mm. so my first thing about 23 is like to stay grounded and then the second thing that I'm really big on this year is men's because previous to 23 has been men and women's work yep 23 me is completely dedicated solely for men's work love that and, and where I'm going with men's work this year is yes to play in the healing space but more so let's fucking play in the growth space mm. I think in self development this is only my observation there's a lot of glorifying, there's a lot of focus on healing, healing, healing. And that's great and it's needed. But if we put so much focus on it, that's what's going to continue to grow. Where's the room for the present moment? Where's the spaces for the creation? Mm -hmm. Because if we truly want different, we've got to do and be different. Mm -hmm. And to be different, we've got to know that I am the creator of the now and I'm the creator of moving forward. So that's what my, my focus is this year, bro. Oh, I love that. And would that be also the reason why you're open to receiving as well? Mm. Fuck it. I've been practicing receiving for years now. <laughs> and bro, in the past, you know, Dane, and I thank you, bro, right in this present moment because I haven't specifically thanked you for the, for the gift that you have gifted me to come to, your, to mm. your, your powerful workshop that I've heard from many men. Yeah, you're welcome, bro. Like we both, at the same time when Dane said what he said, I was like, yep. Mm. Like it, we just felt it. Like after that live and stuff you guys did, um, like I, it's weird, right? Like I, I've known Jay for a while now, but I never knew how tight you two were. Mm. But knowing that you are tight with Jay, fuck, I'll go to war with you, bro, because yeah. I know, I know Jay. Yeah. I know he's had his past. I know he still has his stuff. Mm. We all fucking do, like you said. But it's like my connections with people now are based off a lot of that. I see you for you because of who you may be connected with. But there is levels to that, to that as well because I know some people are just connected for the sake of using each other, mm. right? There's people that are utilizing people just for their own benefits. And I get that. I can understand that networks, you know, energy returns, energy exchanges work well. Um, but I'm starting to see as I level up and I'm probably, you've probably seen this too where people will start to get in your ear for the sake of, there was something, <laughs> there's a dude I know, have you ever heard of Ra? Rah. Started Juicy Fest. Yeah. Big Ra. Um, I don't know how, I just became mates yes. with him somewhere along the line. And he's this dude that just knows everyone. Mm. And there's something he posted where he goes, those who left me on scene will have no other choice but to see me or something like that. And I really liked that because on my journey, I don't like to plan that energy, but I used it for a bit where it was like a passion to be like, fuck you for leaving me on red. Fuck you for not getting back to me. I always get back to everyone. I always respect everyone no matter what level they may seem they're at. And I just respect people now so much that will give me the time that I know I deserve, mm. but I also don't come from a place of like, 
you should talk to me because I'm this, this, and this. It's just this like constant reciprocation of love, energy, and respect. Mm. And what I felt from you, you today, bro, was like all of that, but also for the listener. Mm. And that's why I know that the guests I'm getting on are hitting so hard because you could be going after people that have 1 million followers, 2 million followers, but do they actually give a fuck about what they're saying? Mm. You know, like, do they really care about giving value to anyone listening? Mm. And I feel like that's what you did today. So it was really cool. And, you know, touching on that, are there a few tools, tips, and tactics you would like to leave with anyone that's listening? So if there's any books you've read, podcasts that you love, anything that you've done in the past to help you that you could leave with them? Uh, There's a book that I read recently, bro. It's called The Untethered Soul. I kid you not. I just linked that in my stories really? before. Yeah. Bro, everything's connected. Eh? There's a reason. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm. Interesting. Well, there you go, guys. Untethered Soul is a must listen then. Yeah. And I look if I have to give, I could sit here and just say, oh, yeah, do yeah. this and do yeah, this, yeah. T- this tool and this will help you. I think it's something that's really easy for any of us to practice. And it's fucking powerful if you truly believe it is powerful. I ask people, you know, if it, whatever you're going through you know, and whatever level you're at in your life to start practicing pause. Because when we pause, we create space to respond as opposed to reacting, which means I'm responding to the now moment and not reacting from a past version of myself. Mm. Mm. Damn, I like that. And that's that's works for you and still works for you, obviously. Yeah, and something that I have to keep calling myself forward into, yeah. to keep practicing. Yeah, I like that. And I like the humanness of your, your stuff, bro. Like, I'm very much the same where I never want to get on socials and just be like, I'm always happy, I'm always positive, I'm always motivated. Like, even this morning, I said, I was saying to Sammy before, and even my guest this morning, Charlie, I was like, bro, I woke up feeling like shit. I was on the toilet for like 40 minutes just scrolling TikTok, just avoiding life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I got caught in this just scroll hole. And then I know, though, the difference is compared to old Trav that would have got stuck in those things, those coping mechanisms of overwhelm. It was like, I just break state. Mm. It's like when it's time to show up, eight o'clock, Charlie's here. I'm like, let's fucking go. Mm. Let's get this podcast done. Cause I know if I don't show up for this, potentially someone listening, isn't going to get the value that they deserve. Yeah. So yeah, man, thank you so much. Like this has been gone. Um, I know now we've probably already done. Yep. An hour's up. <laughs> so where can people find you, bro? Uh, our website, bro, www.menmovement.com. Uh, we've literally just posted up all our workshops for this year across both New Zealand and Australia. Mm. Uh, and then we've got two retreat men's retreats here in the Gold Coast as well. So I'm looking forward to everything. When's week. the next one? Uh, our first workshop's in Melbourne in March. And then every month from there, we go across to New Zealand and May to three cities. And then back over here to Sydney and, and Perth. Dude, props for also building your brand back up so quickly. Mm. After, like, did it just get wiped from Instagram? Yeah, well, someone hacked, well, whoever it is, you know, whether it be a bot, whether it be... Yeah, whoever, yeah. Someone hacked my personal Facebook page. So all of my business accounts, so men's stuff, was mm. connected to my one personal page. And they started to post, you know, stuff that went against community guidelines. So they deleted all my pages, including my business suite in the background. And you couldn't even try to get it back? I attempted to. And then they reviewed it and it came back and said, you know, we've reviewed it and we've permanently deleted all your accounts. And I look at it, I said, <coughs> this is the first thing that helped me to shift. And this was the very next day. I said, look, I can sit here and give energy to something that's not serving me. Mm. You know, cry over spilt milk or just simply start again. What am I out here preaching at workshops? You, you get to choose the now. You get to create moving forward. Mm-hmm. And am I going to sit here and worry about the past and, and old versions? Maybe this is the exact thing that the universe said to me, fresh start, yeah. new energy. 2023 is all about that. Most of my journey, bro, has all been focused on healing, healing, healing. I made a conscious choice that next year it's all about creation. Mm. And the universe is like, hey, okay, no problem, I'll serve you that. Yeah, and that's what's felt in this new, like even the stuff you're posting, bro, and the way you're growing so quickly, mm. clearly that's being felt energetically. So mm. you're calling in what you want, you're being the magnet, you're doing the things, you know, shout out to you for the things you're doing. Shout out for wanting to be a part of what we're doing as well and, you know, serving. So, um, yeah, bro, I just want to say thank you so much for today. 
And thank you for the listeners. I'm sure you got plenty from this. If you want to reach out to Wild, do your thing. If you want to reach out to me, do the same thing. If you want to get Sammy on your <laughs> retreats or anything like that, Sammy Ra behind the camera. He's gotten us some content today. You'll see some epic content coming through. Wow. Hit this man up. He's fucking killing it. So thank you, brother. You. Cheers, guys. Let's go. Shop, my brother. Fucking podcast. <laughs> Technician, 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 technician.